Welcome to the Radiology Vault, an open repository for radiology educational content designed for learners and medical professionals. Presented by the Michigan Medicine Department of Radiology. Hi, my name is Ellen Hefner. I'm a neuroradiologist at the University of Michigan. This presentation is on fluoroscopically guided lumbar puncture techniques. Radiologists now perform the largest share of overall lumbar punctures. Slightly over half of LPs are performed by radiologists using imaging guidance, predominantly fluoroscopy, but CT can also be used. This has increased from approximately 10% in 1991. There are a number of patient and provider factors that have led to this trend. Compared to non-image guided LPs, those with imaging guidance have a lower failure rate, fewer traumatic taps, and reduced procedure time. There are a number of indications for a diagnostic LP. In the emergent setting, CNS infection and altered mental status are common indications. Lumbar punctures can be performed for a number of therapeutic reasons and to gain access to the fecal sac for myelography. Patients requiring an LP should undergo a thorough pre-procedural evaluation. There are a number of potential contraindications, including elevated intracranial pressure, low platelets, bleeding disorders, anticoagulant treatment, and infection at the LP site. Patients who fall into one or more of the categories listed should have brain imaging prior to LP, as studies have shown these patients are more likely to have an abnormal brain imaging study. Potential imaging findings that may preclude an LP include shift of midline structures, herniation, or obstructive hydrocephalus. An INR greater than 1.5 is a contraindication to an LP, and in general, a platelet count less than 50,000 is a contraindication. Some studies have shown no increased risk of complications when an LP is performed with platelet counts as low as 20,000. However, multiple consensus guidelines recommend platelet transfusion before an LP if the count is less than 50,000. Anticoagulants should be held for an appropriate length of time. A infection involving the skin, soft tissues, or epidural space in the lumbar region is a contraindication. In these patients, C12 puncture could be considered as an alternative. It is critical to review any prior imaging to help in procedural planning. Factors to note include the number of lumbar type vertebrae, degenerative changes, the caliber of the canal, and the conus level. Cross-sectional imaging can also be very important in measuring the depth from the skin to the canal to help choose the appropriate length needle. If no prior spine imaging is available, the L2-L3 or L3-L4 levels are often chosen as these are usually below the conus but have less degenerative changes than lower levels in the lumbar spine. In this patient, lumbar spine x-rays show that the L2-L3 level is relatively free from degenerative changes with widely patent interlaminar spaces. The patency of the fecal sac is confirmed on the axial image through this level. In this patient with significant degenerative change, extensive prior surgery, and ball gas overlying the spine, it was more difficult to assess the bony anatomy on the spine x-rays. However, a prior spine CT showed a wide laminectomy defect at the L3 level, which allowed easy access to the fecal sac. Most neuroradiologists prefer to perform the procedure in the prone position. In this position, the abdominal girth is compressed and bony anatomy can be better visualized. The patients are also in a more stable position. The lateral decubitus position can be used, but requires a C-arm or biplane fluoroscopy unit. The spinal canal can be accessed in a number of ways. Using the midline approach, the needle is inserted between the spinous processes as indicated by the black arrowhead. Placing a pillow under the lower abdomen can widen the inner spinous space, allowing easier access. With this route, 
the supraspinous and interspinous ligaments are traversed, which can be strong, calcified, and resistant to needle penetration. This is also at the level of the disc space, which can be the narrowest part of the spinal canal with degenerative change. With the interlaminar approach, the needle is inserted off midline between the laminae of adjacent vertebrae, as shown by the yellow arrows. The relatively thinner ligamentum flavum is traversed. This space can be narrowed or obliterated by degenerative change or scoliosis. Additionally, with this route, the lateral part of the spinal canal and thecal sac are entered, which are not the widest portion. In a patient relatively free of degenerative change, this route will usually allow access to the narrower lateral part of the thecal sac. However, if there are significant degenerative changes, particularly facet and ligamentum flavum hypertrophy as shown on the image on the right, the lateral part of the spinal canal can be entered, but the narrow thecal sac may not be entered with this route. Many neuroradiologists prefer the oblique interlaminar approach where the x-ray tube or patient is oblique such that the lumbar vertebrae show the Scotty dog appearance. This opens the interlaminar space as shown by the black circle. This space is located posterior to the foot of the Scotty dog of the more superior vertebrae and above the neck of the Scotty dog of the more inferior vertebrae. With this approach, the needle is directed to the center of the spinal canal. With this approach, as seen on this image, there is greater likelihood of the needle being directed towards and into the thecal sac. It's important to have the puncture site centered in the middle of the image to avoid parallax artifacts. There are several factors to consider when choosing a needle. Most neuroradiologists prefer a 20 or 22 gauge needle. Smaller gauge needles are associated with a lower risk of a postural puncture headache, but bend and deform more easily, have slower CSF egress, and are associated with a longer procedure time. Most standard LP trays come with a needle that is 3.5 inches long. Larger patients may require a longer needle, which is why it is helpful to be able to measure the distance from the skin surface to the spinal canal while planning the procedure. There are different needle tip types that are available. Many neuroradiologists prefer the quinky tip needle, which has a cutting tip with a bevel as indicated by the arrow on the top right image. There is a notch on the hub located on the side of the bevel indicated by the curved arrow on the bottom right image. There are two types of pencil point needles, Sprotty or Whitaker. These have a non-cutting tip as indicated by the black arrow and a side port as indicated by the curved arrow. These are associated with a lower incidence of postural puncture headache, but also a lower initial success rate requiring a change to the quinky tip needle. These types of needles are primarily used by anesthesiologists and neurologists. The spinal needle should be inserted at the marked puncture site such that it is parallel to the x-ray tube. The hub should remain superimposed over the tip of the needle as it is advanced towards the thecal sac as shown in the image. The bevel should be pointed to the right or left such that it is parallel to the spine as this orientation may be associated with a lower risk of postural puncture headache. The stylet should remain within the needle. There is usually increased resistance when crossing the ligamentum flavum with a pop or give when entering the dura. At this point, the stylet can be removed to check for CSF flow. If present, the needle should be rotated so that the bevel is perpendicular to the spine as this may facilitate CSF flow. At this point, opening pressure can be measured, CSF collected, and medication or contrast injected. If there is absent or poor CSF flow, the following steps can be attempted. The patient can be placed in the reverse Trendelenburg position to allow CSF to accumulate in the distal fecal sac. The patient can cough or valsalva, 
the needle can be carefully rotated 360 degrees or withdrawn or advanced one to two millimeters with the stylet in place. Some radiologists perform gentle suction on the needle hub through tubing. However, this should be performed with great care. The stylet should be reinserted into the needle before removal if possible, as this may decrease the risk of postural puncture headache, trauma to nerve roots, and the formation of an epidermoid. Complications are rare, with the most common being a postural puncture headache, which can occur in 10 to 30% of patients. The most common symptom is a positional headache, which becomes more severe when the patient is upright and alleviated when the patient is lying supine. There are a number of risk factors for a postural puncture headache, including female patients, those aged 18 to 50 years, patients with prior history of headaches, and those with a lower BMI. Most post-LP headaches can be treated with conservative treatment, although if persistent or severe, an epidural blood patch may be necessary. Other complications of a lumbar puncture are quite rare. In conclusion, radiologists should be familiar with performing a fluoroscopically guided LP, as these are common procedures performed in radiology departments. Appropriate pre-procedural evaluation and planning is critical. Radiologists should be aware of complications, although rare, with the most common being a postural puncture headache. Thank you for watching this presentation.